Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons is entitled, The Seasons of Life. Hmm, I wonder what would be included in that. Well, this particular lesson is lesson number two in that series entitled, The Choices We Make, All About Choosing. It's lesson number two for April 13 of 2019, and it's going to prove to be a very interesting lesson. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, you know the challenges we have in making good decisions. There are so many options placed before us every day, and so many ways in which the devil would like to lead us astray, help us to make the right choices following your guidance each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I don't think any of us would have any question about the fact that we are faced with a lot of choices every day. Many of those choices are predetermined by our habits. That saves a lot of mental energy. Imagine if you had to decide brand new every morning which shoe, shoe goes on which foot or how to brush your teeth. I mean, we'd never get beyond the first few things we have to do every day. So we develop habits, and it saves a lot of mental energy. Habits can be a very good way to preserve mental energy, but they can also be a terrible evil, as we already know. Most of the decisions we make are simple and have few implications. However, some have enormous implications. Fortunately, even when we make bad choices, there is forgiveness, redemption, and healing available through our loving Heavenly Father. Aren't you glad for the plan of salvation? Wow. Well, Seventh-day Adventists believe that we have free will and free choice. Do you know where we got that idea from? Of course, God, but uh, who were the first, what was the first religious group that really focused on free will and free choice? Anybody remember that history? The Anabaptists. Yeah. Now we're not talking about people back in Old Testament times. We're talking about, you know, times of the Protestant Reformation and so forth. Three, four hundred years ago, I think, Anabaptists. Four, five, four, five hundred years then ago. Then Calvin came with the. Yeah. So there are people who believe still in some churches that God has already decided who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. And we don't really have any choice in the matter whatsoever. What do we call that? Predestination. Predestination. Calvinism. Calvinism. Well, you don't have to be point the finger <laughs> out so directly. God does, however, have plans for us, which were laid even before this world was created. And what is God's plan for us? We'll all be saved. He wants every one of us to be saved. And those plans were set out before this world was created, Ephesians 1, 1 to 4, Titus 1, 1 and 2, and 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9. These verses suggest that even before our world was made, God chose each one of us to be His, and He made provision for us to be redeemed even when we fall short of His plan for us. But God does recognize that some will choose against Him. And why is free will or self-determination so important? Well, there's a couple of passages that are very cogent to this question. Look at Matthew 22. Can I ask John? you a question before you go on? Yeah. So, God has chosen each one of us to be His. That's not just us around the table, that's everyone in yeah. this world. Yes. Is that right? That's correct. So, not just those who love Him, but those who hate Him. That's right. Okay. So, one of the Sadducees came up, uh, I'm sorry, I think it was the Pharisees here in this case. Yeah, Pharisees. One of the Pharisees, a teacher of the law, tried to trap Jesus with a question. Teacher asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, they were sure that no matter which one Jesus chose, they would have some way to trap him. Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second most important commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. The whole law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets depend on these two commandments. Have you ever read that in the Old Testament? Mm -mm. The first one. Yes. The first, but not the second one, as far as I know. Well, 
Oh, why don't you tell us where the first one is? Deuteronomy 6. Yes. Well, and 1 John 4, 8 and 16, as we saw last week's lesson, say twice, God is love. So if love was the foundation of God's government and God is himself, in essence, love, then that's a pretty important thing, isn't it? And his kingdom, God's kingdom, is based on loving him and loving our fellow human beings. But God knows that it is impossible to force love. Love can only be won or earned. The Bible from beginning to end is about how God has reached out to human beings in many and various ways to convince them to do what is best by following his guidance for their lives. Some choose him, others reject him. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a clear way to know which choices are good and which choices are bad? Well, there are several clear steps set out in the Bible for making good choices. One, read 1 Thessalonians 5.17 and James 5, 5. It suggests there that we should pray to God to give us guidance. That would be a good start, right? And then in uh, Isaiah 1.19 and Matthew 7, 24 and 25, it says, it's always safe to obey God and to listen to his word. That's a good second choice. I read the Bible. Read Psalms 119, 105, and 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, God's word is the best and safest guide for our lives. It is an inspired lamp for our feet. Good. Read God's word. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, and Isaiah 58, 11 tell us we should always keep the Lord in mind with each decision that we make. If we choose his side, we will always be happy with our choices. And Proverbs 15, 22 and 24, 6 say, if it is always appropriate to get good advice from wise people. So how do you know who the wise ones are? Those that listen to the Lord. Yes. <laughs> so why is it so hard for us as naturally selfish human beings to give up on our own desires and wishes and accept God's will for our lives even though if we stop and think seriously, we know that God's plans for us are always better than our plans. So why is it so difficult to give up our selfish? And where did those selfish desires and wishes come from? There are naturally selfish things that we, that we're, that we have. Mm -hmm. My grandchildren are selfish. My children are selfish. I'm Only selfish. Only your grandchildren? Well, everyone else is too. <laughs> but, by the way, uh, you said earlier about love the Lord your God and then the second part of uh, and love your neighbor love your neighbor as yourself. The footnote in my Bible suggests that Leviticus 19.18 says okay. that. Well. And sure enough, Leviticus 19.18, do not take revenge on others or continue to hate them, but love your neighbors if you, as you love yourself. Okay, yeah, that's true. I've forgotten about Leviticus 19, 18. You're right. Yeah. So, as we all know already by experience, that choosing good friends is very important. So, how do we know if a friend is a good one? Someone who says, no, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> when we see a new friendship developing, do we stop for a moment and ask God if it's a good relationship? There's quite a lot of wise counsel in the book of Proverbs about choosing good friends. I uh, wish we had time to read more of these verses. Proverbs 12, 26, 17, 17, 18, 24, 22, 24 to 25. Choosing Christian friends is always best. If we want to have good friends, we must be a good friend ourselves. Mm -hmm. Choosing people with hot, violent tempers is a dangerous plan. Carrie, I think you have something about choosing friends. Yes. Even the best of us have these unlovely traits. And, oh in and in selecting friends, we should choose those who will not be driven away, away from us when they learn that we are not perfect. Mutual forbearance is called for. We should love and respect one another, notwithstanding the faults and imperfections that we cannot help seeing. For this is the spirit of Christ. Humility and self-distrust should be cultivated. And, pa and a patient tenderness with the faults of others. This will kill out all narrowing selfishness and make us large-hearted and generous. This comes from Signs of the Times, March 5, 1885. Wow. Pastoral Ministry, page 95, paragraph 1. 
That would be good if we all did that, wouldn't it? Think of the story of David and Jonathan. Imagine Jonathan, his father is the king. And so what was going to be his natural position when his father passes? He's going to be the next king, right? But then he learns that God has chosen David. Is he jealous of David? No. Is he angry? Does he try to get rid of David like his father was trying to do? Like brothers. Jonathan didn't hold any grudges. Do you think you would have made a good Jonathan? Or a good David? Well, we know about friends. One very important thing. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Bad companions ruin good character. We don't want that to happen to us. Of all the friends we choose in our lifetime, the most important choice is the friend that we choose as our spouse. It was so easy for Adam. He had no that's, choice. That's a cheating, what? <laughs> he had no choice. <laughs> well, he chose a perfect wife. She was the only choice around. That's right. <laughs> but the choice is not nearly so easy for us. However, God has not left us without guidance. Choosing a good Christian spouse is the most important decision we make in our lives after choosing to follow the Lord and being a good Christian ourselves. And that's, of course, you're not going to find a good Christian spouse unless you choose to be a good Christian yourself. It would be impossible for God to give us a specific guidance for choosing the right spouse by naming that person in the Bible. We can't find a verse there that says that one is the one you should choose. But God does give some general guidance. And Psalm 37, 27, and 119, 19, James 1, 23 to 25. I'm going to read that one. James 1, 23 to 25. Whoever listens to the word but does not put it into practice is like a man who looks in a mirror and sees himself as he is. He takes a good look at himself and then goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But those who look closely into the perfect law that sets people free, who keep on paying attention to it and do not simply listen then forget it, but put it into practice, they will be blessed by God in what they do. Question. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Lord himself has had a very dysfunctional family from the oh very dear. beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the greatest uh, leaders that he has had in the, in the Old Testament, their kids were all screwed up so badly. Yes. So what, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. That's the problem what with love. Do? Well, you have to have the freedom to choose. And many times people will choose the wrong path. And, well, I, and I, I think there's another side to that. I am sure that the devil works extra hard on those on kids. the pastor's kids. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, and uh, the scriptures don't say so much about the wives of these leaders. Yeah. Did all of them make wrong choices? We do not know. I don't think so. But the free will, of course, goes there. So. Didn't God do a perfect job with all of those third of the angels that yeah. there you chose? Go. You know? There you go. So trying to put a child when you, where you should go, Proverbs 22, 6. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean you're going to turn out right. You know, you're still free to reject it. Okay. When marrying spouses, do we think of this verse? Do for others what you want them to do for you. This is the meaning of the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. The golden rule. Do we, do we do that when we choose our friends? Well, in Romans 2, 2, Paul has some very blunt words for those who hasten to criticize others. Very often when we criticize someone for doing something wrong, it is because we are very familiar with doing that wrong thing ourselves. Have you ever, you know, you've heard the expression, the pot calls the kettle black? <laughs> 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 yeah. Very often we criticize someone for, or, or, have you ever wished for certain characteristics in your spouse when in fact you lack those characteristics yourself? Do we love our spouses enough so that all through our lives we seek to find ways to make them happier? Another very important choice we make is our choice of a career. A relatively small number of people have the privilege of staying home and guiding the lives of their children to become noble Christians. That's the best profession of all. But others of us must reach out into the community and earn a living. 
So what kind of guidance can we get from God to show us what our future career should be? Is there a verse in the Bible that says, be a doctor, be a farmer? No, there isn't. So it, is it safe to take an examination that professes to give us guidance about what career to choose? You know, there's lots of those kind of examinations. Well, think of the example of Solomon. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 to 11, he gives some very strong advice to his children. While in his early life, Solomon did many wonderful, and, you know, he, well, just, we know about what that says. While in his early life, Solomon did many wonderful and noble things, the greatest of which was building that magnificent temple. But later in life, he deteriorated into looking mostly for entertainment and pleasure. And his conclusion? Vanity. It didn't mean a thing. It was like chasing the wind no use, of no use at all. But in our day, when it's so easy to tune into almost any kind of entertainment, you can, you can, I happen to be listening to an important program on my way home from work this evening, and I, and I was driving, and you know, I have my little, little phone there, and I'm connected into my car's audio system, and I'm listening to a broadcast that's over the internet. As I'm driving my car, I mean, and imagine what all the crazy things you could, I could have been listening to. Yeah. Well, how many of us make Solomon's mistake? Look at 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. That, of course, couldn't apply to any of us, right? You don't have to be rich to have love for money. How many children and even spouses would have been very happy with a humbler lifestyle instead of having their father and spouse gone so much of the time? In the beginning, God chose husbands and wives to work together in a beautiful setting. Would that, would that were always possible in our day? When their lives are near the end, how many people do you think have wished that they had spent more time in the office and less time with their family? <laughs> I see some people shaking their heads. It's the other side of the coin, isn't it? Yeah. But every important decision requires thinking. And we need to remember that free will is just that, really free. God makes sure that it's free. No matter how much pressure may be brought upon us from within or from without, we can never be forced to do what is wrong unless we agree. Think of the story of Jacob and his 12 sons again. He had been favored by his mother while his brother Esau was favored by his father. And what did he do? He favored Joseph. And as a result, his brothers did that terrible deed of selling Joseph into slavery in Egypt. None of them could possibly have even dreamed that the story would end the way it did. <laughs> you, know, you have to chuckle when you think about that. And think about the story of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in Numbers 16. When the things didn't go the way they thought they should go, what did they do? They challenged Moses and, and Aaron. And what happened to them? Dark they were swallowed up by the earth. Think of the story of Daniel in, uh, in Daniel 6. He was faithful and true to God. He opened his windows and he prayed toward Jerusalem no matter what the law said. And what happened to him? Thrown in the lion's den. He was there all night long. And was he, was he harmed? No. Not at all. And what happened to the people who were accusing him? They got to spend some time in the lion's, but not, lion's den, but not very long, right? And their families. Yeah. Since uh, if I think we'd have the time, uh, Korah, De Dathan, and Obaram, mm -hmm. um, their motive perhaps was wrong, but they did have an issue, I think if I remember it. And so the way they approached it was wrong to me. Mm -hmm. uh, because they did have uh, good points. I'm not sure when Moses chose those 120 leaders could have been afterwards I don't quite remember mm -hmm. but it's it's yeah it, it's fine to discuss the issues but right motive and who gets the glory 
that's the lesson I get out of yeah. that. Wasn't it? Wasn't uh, Moses following Jethro's advice? It wasn't God's yeah. instruction that he do that. That it's is just, correct. Uh, there's just a record of what, what, what yeah, was yeah. happening. It wasn't Jethro God came, endorsing Jethro it. Jethro came and said, "You're nuts. Yeah. You know, you're, you're hurting yourself." Yeah. Well, but this, the the case of Korah, Death, and Byron happened after they turned back at at Kadesh Barnea from entering the land, and, and and Moses and Aaron said, "Sorry, God says." You know, you didn't follow me. You're not willing to do my will. You rebelled when the when the spies gave their report, and so we're headed back into the desert. Yeah. And Korodath and Byram said, "We can do better than that. We're not gonna we're not gonna uh. follow these advice of, of Moses and Aaron." Well, think about the Bible stories that you know. How many of them would guide you in making choices? And what are the implications? Often we. We enjoy the stories, but do we stop and think of the implications? What would you say to a friend who asked you to give them guidance in getting married? <laughs> would you be capable of giving good advice? And how do choices become habits? How are bad habits formed? Same way as good habits. Lots of choices, huh? Why are they so hard to get rid of? Is it not fair that Jesus never had to deal with a bad habit? And why didn't he ever have to deal with a bad habit? He never developed any. He had the choice though. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. And he chose against He was it. tempted. He chose against those bad habits. Well, would you agree that the gift of free choice is the most important gift that God has given us? Yes. Without that, you don't have love. Yeah. Do you sometimes wish that you were not quite so free? I know about a lady one time who said she would be willing to give up almost all of our freedom if God would just guarantee her a place in heaven. Doesn't work that way. What do you think God would say to you if you said God if you said to God, just take away my choice but promise me a place in heaven? No. Oh. Won't happen. What did you say to her? No, it wasn't me, it was oh, somebody else oh. I know. But God just doesn't work that way. Oh. Love is the very centerpiece of God's government, but love is not simple. And we're going to look at a handout on that in just a moment. Charles, I think you have something about God and his revelation and so forth. Yes, our God is a God of revelation and patience. He communicates with us through nature. Psalms 19, 1 to 3, heavens declared the glory of God. And, um, Romans 1, 20. Prayer, Matthew 21, 22. I think this is talking about Jesus praying. Mm -hmm. yeah. And James 1, 5. Through scriptures, uh, Psalms 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, light unto the world. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16. Godly counselors, Proverbs 11, 14, 15, 22. And most gloriously, through the life and words of Jesus, Hebrew chapter 1, Verses 2 Amen. to 3. These are our lights in the world. We really shouldn't be making significant choices without consulting them, especially in the areas of lesson highlights. Number one, choosing friends. Number two, choosing a life partner. Number three, choosing a life occupation. Adult uh, Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 26. Do we think of these guiding principles before we make important decisions? Is it true that we are who we are because of our choices? Of course, we recognize that our other people's choices have affected us. We, in turn, have affected other people by our choices. Do we always think carefully about the ramifications of our choices? What kind of choices are we making when we choose to watch television or a movie? Do we carefully evaluate what kind of influence that presentation is going to have on us before we watch it? It's, is it even possible to do that? If you watch those funny little trailers that they call that are sort of a, supposed to be a summary of the, of, the, of the movie, is that a fair uh, way to evaluate a movie? Do we have a carefully thought out and reasonably ethical framework for the decisions we make? Why is it that convenience Cultural trends, peer pressure, emotions, habits, and mere preferences are unreliable guides for the choices that lead to the life that God intended for us. God's plan for each of us is to grow into His image. 
Genesis, see Genesis 1, 27. God says, I may, He made man, and, man, woman in His image. And 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we have a very specific comment on that by Ellen White. Jackie? Uh-oh. It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. The Great Controversy 555. And what if our, all of our spare time is spent in watching television, watching movies? How does that impact us? Well, John 17, 3, Jesus says, eternal life is to know the Father and your Son. And I don't see how you're going to find that from television programs oh, or movies. Oh, Jim, how could you say <laughs> such a thing? Well, it's pretty plain. And you go to John, John chapter 6. Yeah. Eat, uh, if you eat my flesh, drink my blood, and I will raise you in the last day. I mean, that's well, about let me 10 just, verses there. Let me just read the verse they are recommending here, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. All of us then... Reflect the glory of the Lord with uncovered faces. And that same glory coming from the Lord, who is a spirit, transforms us into his likeness in an ever greater degree of glory. So Paul is saying, if we are Christians, if we belong to this Christian group, and we share these different ideas in church, what are we actually doing? We are seeing Jesus. We are seeing him manifested, hopefully in the lives of other church members. And what does that do to us? It's supposed to transform us. What was it? By beholding. 1785. What? 1785 Entoli Entoli from oh. 1781 injunction, i.e. Oh an authority well, as we, description. As, we, as, we, as we have five senses, we know about the vision, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. smell. Do we think about what impact they will have on all those five senses every day? There's an apocryphal story about, told about the great sculptor Michelangelo. When he made that famous statue of David, he was asked, How did you create such a masterpiece from a rough chunk of marble? It is said that Michelangelo responded, I simply chipped away everything that didn't look like David. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> well, could we form lives like God by chipping away everything that doesn't does not reflect the character of God? A Christian ethicist has suggested that there are three bases on which we can make wise decisions. One, principles. Two, rules of action. And three, normative models. Principles should be grounded on solid scripture. See, for example, the Ten Commandments, the Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, the Gospels, especially the Sermon on the Mount, and the Epistles. If we studied those passages, if we study them carefully and adopt what they say, wouldn't that protect us most of the time? Well, then there are rules for taking action. God gave specific guidance to people like Gideon. We think about that. The rich young ruler, even Peter, when he struck the high priest's servant's ear. We may not be in exactly the same situation that those men are in, but their stories and others in the Bible give us good general guidance for things like worship, idolatry, finances, priorities, and violence. And then there are cases of normative models. Think of all the Bible stories with which you're familiar. What lessons can you learn from them? How often would we find that a Bible story might give us fairly specific guidance in a particular situation? In Scripture, it was often necessary for God to discipline His children. God may have to discipline us in one way or another, but if, we, if He's a true Father, isn't that His responsibility? Isn't the father supposed to be? To, isn't he supposed to discipline in love, of course? Does God more often discipline by circumstances or by taking direct action against us? Well, there's a famous verse here in Hebrews 12, 5 to 8 that gives us a clue. Have you forgotten the encouraging words which God speaks to you as his sons and daughters? My child, pay attention when the Lord corrects you. Do not be discouraged when he rebukes you. Because the Lord corrects everyone he loves and punishes everyone he accepts as his child. Endure what you suffer as being a father's punishment. Your suffering shows that God is treating you as a <coughs> children. Was there ever a child who was not punished by his father? 
If you're not punished as all, as all his children are, it means that you're not real children but bastards. Hmm. Almost afraid to read that word out of the Bible, huh? It's used so, so wrongly so much of the time. Do we live as if we believe that God's discipline is always for our best good? Do we ever get discipline from Satan? What would that be like? Like Job. Yeah. He can't touch us unless God allows it. Yeah, but God does allow it sometimes. Yes, he does. Does Satan ever suggest that we are being forced to give up that sinful pleasure? Another important normative model might be the example of Isaac. He was told not to choose a woman from among those living among, around him, Genesis 24, 6. He trusted others to make wise choices even on his behalf, Genesis 24, 1 to 4. But he also spent considerable time meditating and praying about the results, Genesis 24, 63. And fortunately, it seemed that it worked out for the best. I, I'm trying to imagine what it would be like to have someone disappear and you know, okay, when he comes back, he's be going to be bringing my wife. Who are the women that Isaac was exposed to in Canaan? Abraham had literally thousands of people working for him. Wouldn't they be mainly the ones that Isaac would have been exposed to and chose as a wife? If not them, then the Canaanites. Yeah. Well, we suggested earlier that uh, we would want to talk a little bit about the subject of love. Uh, in this lesson. So I'm going to talk about it, and, and, and we're going to read some, first, some verses first, very familiar verses. 1 John 4, 8, whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And verse 16, and we ourselves know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and those who live in love live in union with God, and God lives in union with them. And then Matthew 22, 36 to 40. Teacher, he asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and the most important commandment. The second most important commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. The whole law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets depend on these two commandments. So, It sounds so profound and yet so simple. Love is probably the word that has come to be associated with Christianity more than any other. But is it really that simple? Follow me as we consider it for a few minutes. What God wants most of all in his universe is what? Loving, understanding, friends, right? But love is much more than just a warm, fuzzy, emotional response. Think of the implications of this simple concept. In order to be able to love, one must also be able to hate. Why is that? If you love just because you have no other choice, you have to love, you're, you're just a robot, right? God wants more than mere robots. Suppose you took a digital recorder, pressed the record button, and spoke clearly into the microphone the following words, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you, and many times as you want it. If you then push the button, the play button, and you were, would you be delighted to know that the tape recorder was saying, I love you? You would think it was a crazy stunt. <laughs> would, you give the big, would you give the tape recorder a big hug? No. I wouldn't share my Valentine chocolates with him, I'll tell That's you that. That's for sure. <laughs> you would think the whole exercise was a bit silly. Because the tape recorder or the tape record, or the digital recorder has not, no control over what it says. It only repeats what you tell it. So, in order for God to have creatures that truly love him, he had to create them <clears throat> with freedom of choice. This, in turn, implies a lot of other things. Let's consider. If God wants real love and at the same time grants real freedom, then he must give us a basis on which to build that love. And what would that basis be? Choice. Choice. We have to have choice. What else is required? We have to have an example, don't we? 
Where does the example, the best example for love come from? Jesus. Jesus. God himself. Jesus himself. So, when he truly loves us, he asks for a love response in return. He will, in effect, have to win our love. But how do you do this if someone is truly free? Well, to be really free, one must have choices, right? Choices are not the same as chances. You've all probably seen times with kids, of, you know, this, the, the little game. You have something that, something the child wants, he said, okay. And it, you hold your hand out and the child wants to grab it and you say, no. And you put your hands behind your back and you go back and forth a little bit and you come out. And Now, if, you're, if the ob object is large or if it's irregularly shaped, maybe they can tell by, by looking at your hand. But just assume for the moment that that is not and it's completely hidden. So you ask the child to choose. What, what, what percentage of time is he going to get the right answer? 50. 50% probably, right? Unless he has a preponderance of love for one side of your, of your body or something like this. But it's only 50%. And, and that's not choice. What is that? That's just chance. chance. In fact, there's a whole law of chance. What do we call those laws of chance? Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah. What? Probability. Yeah. Otherwise called statistics. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, w God is not into the game, I into the, the, the business of, of playing chances or playing games with us. God does not want to just, he, if he were, he would be just an arbitrary, capricious God who enjoys entertaining himself with our foolish activities. And God is not like that. So in order for God to give us real freedom, he must give us real choices. What kind of real choices does God give us? Take dominion. Clear back in Genesis. Mm -hmm. Take dominion. And, uh, hey, he, he, well, as you read through the Old Testament, he, God still gave freedom to uh, choice to the hev other heavenly intelligences, the, even the, good, the bad ones. For, uh, if you look at Psalms 82 and, and uh, mm -hmm. Deuteronomy. So, does God ever hide things in his hands and say, take your no. choice? No. No. No, it's all out there. I mean, he, he, here you choose to eat what you do and you pay the consequences. Uh, you said spare time. I'm not sure how people even have spare time, you know, yeah. and then, <laughs> and, and, and then, I mean, uh, we cannot be watching whatever we want and it's a Friday afternoon, evening, okay, let's put this away. And No, we, we have been given the choice. See, we choose how we spend the time. So what you're we saying have. is that God gives His choices with open hands. Absolutely. Okay. So it should be easy for us, right? <laughs> well, you see the beautiful Bible text: "For I lay before you life and death, choose. blessings and curse. Mm -hmm. Choose life and live." How beautiful! How beautiful! Okay. So that means that w when, we, when God opens his hands like this, he doesn't leave us with something we don't know what we're choosing. I mean, if God just gave you two black boxes, okay, choose. Is that a choice? Again, it's, a still, it's still just a chance, isn't it? So, right. so God, when he opens his hands, he, we must say, yeah, I understand what this is, and I understand what that is, and now I'm choosing life and death, blessings and cursings. Those are clear choices, right? Understanding what, you're, what God is offering is very important. Mm -hmm. That's what allows us to make real choices. So, do we just choose what looks good? No, I, I like, Most people do. I like the word implications that you mm -hmm. use there. We, you've got to know what's coming. Yeah. So, the next issue is, okay, when you make a choice, you want to know Okay, is that going to be a good choice, not just today, but tomorrow and down the line, right? So, there must be few, we, in order to make an honest, good choice, we must have some idea about the future implications of what choice we're making. Now, a lot of times we choose, you know, this is called ethics, situation ethics sometimes. Just choose based on what's happening right now, okay? Yes, Jackie. 
I'm thinking of God creating everything for Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he wants to do is he wants to spend all day with them on Sabbath to let them get to know him. He wants to come to the garden, walk with them and talk with them. Mm -hmm. um, so I see a God who in Revelation where he wants to come in and sup with me. God wants to get to know me mm -hmm. and show me who he is. Mm -hmm. I have to taste and see that he is good. Mm -hmm. He reveals himself in nature. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful gift that he's made for all of us yep. to enjoy. When I taste the peach, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a gift from God. So to me, he's offering himself to me. Yeah to be with me, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I find out what he is like. Our evolution, yes, Gordon. This choice is an interesting thing. I've um, done uh, several research projects, and in order to do research projects on human subjects, you have to have this informed consent mm -hmm. document. And not only do you have to have this document, which lays out all the all the things. Potentially all the things that could happen. Yeah. But you really, to really give informed consent, the person has to understand that. Mm -hmm. And that's what God has given us. He's given us an informed consent yes. mm -hmm. to, to look over and consider yes. and to choose. And so not only that, yes. he came and lived that informed consent. Yeah. He says, do you want to be like Jesus or don't you? And people that's choose. Exciting. To, to judge God. There, mm -hmm. The process is judging God's ways or down the highway. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not that God's going to let uh, shove you out. He just, yeah. if you're bent on leaving, he'll let you go, and that's called God's wrath. So, yeah, some translations. God has given us a clear choice. He says, look at the life of Jesus. Now, we, I wish we had 100 books on the life of Jesus, not just, you know, the Gospels and Desire of Ages and so forth like that, but we have enough oh, yeah. to give us a very clear pattern. Think of the opposite of that. Evolutionists believe that we have chaos. What, what happens if you, I mean, what happens in a chaotic situation? You just, it's nothing but chance. There's no, there's no choice in, in a chaotic universe, right? Because whatever you pick today, it could be something, either you don't know what, it, what you're getting or it, it, the consequences might be completely different tomorrow. Yeah, but out of the ruins of an earthquake, whatever, mm -hmm. what is the chance that uh, B-52 is going to come up? No. So or some, as someone suggested, uh, could you get Webster's Dictionary from an explosion in a print shop? Yeah. <laughs> but that's what they want you to believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. On on uh, campuses where they have no God, mm -hmm. they, it's totally. Uh, Most. And you know what? It, I'm going to interrupt you God. for just a second. I recently saw a thing in. I won't mention where it was found, but it was from an authentic source saying that there are people now in the United States Congress that are are coming up with the idea that every congressman should renounce any religious oh. preference, otherwise they shouldn't serve in Congress. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. In and some respects that yeah. would be good, because then we wouldn't be having church intermingled with state. Well, but, but. Downsize everything. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I was discussing with somebody just recently, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jackie. Yeah. Hope you don't forget your idea. Yeah but uh, about this issue with someone who was a Jew. And, oh, wow. you know, and you talk about this, and, and these people say, well, we're, this is progression. We're making yeah. progression. Yeah. I said, that's the reason we have a, we have a, we have a, um, Holocaust Museum. No, well, Holocaust <laughs> Museum, <laughs> that too, too, but no. Yeah. That's the reason we have a, yeah. what I meant to say is a constitution yeah. and a bill of rights. Those are, those are supposed to be un inalienable rights. And what's happening? We're chipping away at them all the time. 
We're chipping away at them all the time. And, and the politicians, they take an oath to support and defend, and they're all liars. Yeah. And they're thieves. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, very, the very nature of what they do. And then we want to get laws from them, and we listen to them, and uh, nobody has, to, or very few people have respect for them. Yeah, if the Congress that was first set up under George Washington would reject almost every single Congress person that we have today. Yep. They, would not, they would not be admitted to a, the, the first Congress at all, no. none of them. Okay, well, too much of politics. You if we lived in a... <laughs> you you want me to finish it? I do. I still have it. Okay. Okay. On campus, you have lots of knowledge. Mm -hmm. There is so much knowledge. Great minds, intellect. Mm -hmm. But there's no wisdom. There's no discernment. This is the only, the only thing that God has given us where you can find wisdom that right. makes any sense of the knowledge, because knowledge without wisdom is useless. Yeah. There is, a, there is a move in California House of, that uh, the Bible uh, is, if they have their own way, the Bible will be something of the thing of past in California. They, I'm not talking about the, you know, this is for real. To me, when I look at the picture, uh, what's happening in Washington, D.C. now, uh, as Hegelian dialectic is in, yep. yes it is, yes. Yeah. so the well, pendulum is swinging so far that, okay, this is how far it's going to be, we're going to tell you, uh, and we're, perhaps we're even a Christian group is going to be in charge. We're following in the footsteps of the French Revolution. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Well, our redemption draw it nice. Yes, <laughs> well. If we made a choice and it turned out that that choice looked good today, turned out to be deadly tomorrow, it still wouldn't be, that wouldn't be choice. You would still be, really, be, this would be chaos. So in order to make real love possible, God had to create an orderly universe in which choices that are good today are still good tomorrow. We need an orderly universe. We would have to be able to study reality at least long enough during one lifetime so that we could get a reasonably good idea what the results of each of our regular choices was going to be. But think of the implications of this. We would need to have a universe that is orderly enough so that science would be possible. Laws would describe the way things work. The law of gravity. The law of gravity. In allowing us freedom, God recognized that sooner or later, someone might choose to work against his plan. Then he would have to deal with the problems that arose in this orderly universe. Does, is, is, even though Satan would like to create a chaotic universe, he can't. Even Satan, by and large, has to work within the laws of cause and effect that God has laid down, right? So what happened? Lucifer, the leader of the angels, was the one who rebelled. And that's a familiar thing, but let's just look at it. Revelation 4, uh, I mean, sorry, 12, verse 4. With his tail, he dragged a third of the stars out of the sky and threw them down to the earth. He stood in front of the woman in order that, to eat her child as soon as it was born. And this, of course, is the, the, the huge red dragon. And then, verse, starting with verse 7, then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge red dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. His choices had implications. Mm. He in turn convinced one third of the angels and our first parents to join him in the rebellion. And you know about what happened there in the Garden of Eden. And you just wonder, you know, I think about that fairly often. Did Eve stop before she took that fruit and think about what, we, what, what was really going on, what, was, what, what implications that would have? We don't have record of her thinking about it. No. Uh, did Adam notice that Eve wasn't with her? Did he say, where are you, Eve? It's his fault he fell asleep. Right, Judy? He was on his iPad. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, we don't have record of, of Adam being concerned either. Yes. No. We, um, yeah. we do have a comment by Martin Luther. Have you heard of his comment? Oh, yes. He said if devil had tried to tempt Adam instead of Eve, Adam would have said, no way. <laughs> no sexism there. No. <laughs> well, thus our world became the testing ground for the great controversy. God no doubt wished that he could prevent all evil consequences from befalling all of his children, any of his children. But in order to have an atmosphere of love, remember God knew that he would have to stand back and allow things to take their course. Why is that? Because actions and decisions have to have, con have consequences. And in order to have the ability to make a reasonable choice, you have to know the consequences. Okay, what you're saying is, we live in an orderly universe. Yes. God says, I can't give up orderliness or I'm giving up love. So in order to have love, he has to have order. So that means in an orderly universe, if you make bad choices, what's going to happen? Bad consequences, right? And so God stands back. And, you know, sometimes even in the Bible, it talks about people crying, God, why don't you do something? Well, God has the power. Don't we all agree that God has the power? He could step in. I mean, look at the flood. I mean, take your pick. I mean, lots of times in the Old Testament, God seemed to actually act in human, uh, in human environment. Uh, he has the power to step in. He could stop us from sinning. He could stop us from experiencing the consequences of our sinning if he wanted to. But if he did that, what would happen to our freedom? It would be gone. Instead, God chose to allow things to take their natural course, with people mostly reaping the consequences of their own actions and thus of their and those of their forefathers. What did what did, did does it say, do? What did Moses say about doing reaping the consequences of third and fourth third generation and fourth. to the third and fourth generations? But the consequences, the loving on the loving side, into thousands of generations, right? God would only step into human history to exercise his power and force, when it was, which I don't think God ever uses force, when it was absolutely necessary to preserve the human race or to prevent them from losing contact with him. And so we read the record of the Old Testament. God had to allow things to go from bad to worse, according to human choices, until finally at the time of the flood, things had become so bad that God was, ab was about to lose contact completely with the human race. Many things still needed to be demonstrated, like what needed to be demonstrated. Genesis 3.15, he still needed to show that he was going to send someone who was going to teach us the right way. Hadn't happened yet. So God himself drowned all of his children except eight. And so the story went on for thousands of years. Now it is our turn to live on this earth. And God is preserving a complete record of everything that has been been thought, said, and done here on planet Earth as a permanent protection against such a thing ever happening again. So how is the record of this Earth becoming a permanent protection? protection? How does that help? It will go into the record book and the universe will say never again, just as there are the Holocaust museums, Dachau and other places where there's the plaque that says Never again. Mm -hmm. Because we remember, we can remember what those kinds of choices brought. Well, let's, let's think about that. God, as far as we know, has been creating down through time. And he created this earth, and then, or, or some, at about the time he created this earth, the Satan rebelled. And so e sin and evil came into our, our, our universe. And God apparently has stopped creating new beings. And why would he stop creating new beings? Temporarily? What would Satan say if all of a sudden God made another world? I have to have access to them, right? Mm. So God has stopped creating as far as we know. Is there any reason why God shouldn't start again when this whole sin thing is over with? Probably will. Stop, start creating again. 
What if a million years or a billion years in the future, he creates someone and that person says, why do we have to do things God's way? I want to do it my way. What would happen? I think God would say, hold on, sit down there. I have something I want you to see. Here's a story of planet Earth. And after watching that, if they, didn't, if they weren't convinced about the, the, the evil consequences of choosing their own way instead of God's way, what would God say? He would gather us all around. I'm, this is hypothetical. I don't think it'll ever happen. But God could gather us all around, those of us who have been through this terrible experience, and he could have said, okay, what do you think I should do with this person who wants to go his own way? Do you think we should do the great controversy all over again? Nope. No, we will say, stand back, let him disconnect himself <laughs> yeah. from your power. Yeah. Stand back, just leave him alone, and he will self-destruct. So, God only needs to let sin happen once. Our little planet is and will forever be the lesson book of the universe. God has declared that love is the best, even the only way to run a universe. The devil and this earth are in the midst of an experiment to try to prove that God is wrong. We may choose which side of this whole great controversy we are going to be on, <coughs> but as we decide, let us remember that the consequences and implications of each choice are far from simple. So you out there, like us, have choices. You have choices to make every day. We've talked about some of the most important choices that we make in our lifetimes. But the most important choices, choice we make is to be like God, to be a Christian, to be loving. And as we've just suggested, love requires an orderly universe. It requires us to make right choices. It, re it requires us to to, to learn how to love people around us, even maybe some who aren't so loving. It requires a lot of things, but it's not simple. Love has a lot of implications. It's not just a, a flight of feeling or a, something like that that so many people today think it is. Love is a principle. Love is the foundation of God's government. If we want to be a part of that government, then we need, we need to learn what real love is like and how to live by it. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word, to think about all that we have seen here and, and thought about, and help us to learn what real love means and how to live by it, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen.